Well, I want to thank Bill and Kathy, our very gracious hosts, and Kamloops Center for Rational Thought and Humanist Canada and BC Humanists, because of course I jumped at the chance to visit beautiful BC, and I have a lot of relatives in Vancouver, and I get there pretty regularly, but I've never been to Kamloops. And in fact, until these conferences started, I'd never heard of Kamloops, <laughs> and you know, I'm, us US citizens, and so I started quizzing people the week before I came here, just random people, my bank teller, our staff, where do you think Kamloops is? And by the way, we're not here, we're in Australia. That was the typical response. Um, we, uh, Dan and I just came back from a conference called the uh, Freedom from Religion in the Bible Belt, and we put on a conference with our chapter in Raleigh, and um, we wanted to add a global character, so we invited the a founder of Atheist Ireland to come and give a global perspective, Michael Nugent, and I don't know if any of you know him. But the motto of Atheist Ireland is really timely for those of us in the United States. Uh, the motto is, you have rights, your beliefs do not. And you may have heard the states that are trying to pass laws, and in fact one has passed so vendors could refuse to uh, bake a cake if it's a gay marriage, or if you have a, a, a religious objection to serving a gay person or an atheist, the anti-discrimination laws would not belong to you. And I'm wondering how many of you have heard of the Hobby Lobby uh, Supreme Court case before the Supreme, uh, it's, it, we're waiting very suspensefully for a decision to come down any day now from the US Supreme Court on um, this chain called Hobby Lobby. Do you have that in Canada? No. It's a craft chain store and Stephen Green runs it and he's a religious fanatic and he wants to determine what kind of contraception his thousands of women workers can use. He's challenging uh, the Affordable Care Act's contraceptive mandate, Obamacare, um, that lets us have insurance and lets women's uh, birth control coverage be um, full and he doesn't believe in the IUD or forms of birth control, and he thinks he has the right to deny this. And this case is before our very right-wing Supreme Court, where we have six Roman Catholics, five who vote in lockstep with each other, one who is liberal, and only two women, so out of nine. So um, this issue of, of twisting the concept of religious liberty to use it like a weapon to impose your religious doctrine on others is a huge fight right now in the United States. But anyway, I had the pleasure of introducing Michael Nugent of Atheist Ireland, and I decided to tell a little joke that had an Irish flavor, and I'm gonna tell you this joke. Um, a priest was walking past a little parishioner, Kathleen, in Dublin, and she was holding a basket and staring into it very intently, and he went over and it said to Kathleen, what is that you've got there? And she told him, I've got kittens, and they're Catholic kittens. <laughs> and of course he beamed and smiled, and, and that's wonderful. And a few days later, a few weeks later, he walked by, and the kittens were on the, the lawn of the park playing, and he came by to ask her how the little Catholic kittens were doing. And she said, oh no, Father, they're not Catholic kittens anymore. And he was shocked, and he said, why not? And she said, they're atheist kittens uh, because their eyes are opened. <laughs> so, so I'm going to talk ab about how my eyes were opened to the dangers of religion and government. And really I'm going to tell you a creation story, only it's not a myth. It's the genesis of how the Freedom from Religion Foundation began. And, um, what we do and why we founded it and what FFRF is doing to achieve secular government and to help reason prevail. And at the conclusion of this talk, I'd like to tell you uh, about how the Freedom from Religion Foundation is on the number one enemy list of every single denomination in the United States today, 
with practically every church and denomination and mosque and synagogue working in concert together um, to defeat one of our most significant state church lawsuits. Um, but before I begin, I wanted to show of hands how many people in the room here are Canadian? Is it most of you? Yeah, okay. So I will bear that in mind when I explain things. So um, many years ago, and I'm going to uh, out my age, it was actually 38 years ago, my mother, Anne Nicole Gaylor, and I uh, decided that we needed to start a group. And what had happened is uh, I was in college, and she was a feminist full-time volunteer activist, and we'd had reason to go before the Madison, Wisconsin City Council, where we lived and still live, and discovered that not only were they having clergy come in and to open the city council with Christian prayer, but even at the committee level, they were beginning with prayer, and we were shocked. And so we thought we should protest this and ask to get on the agenda, and we thought it would seem a little lame to have a mother-daughter team, um, and that it would sound much more powerful if we said we represented an organization. So we made up the Freedom From Religion Foundation. And it was an easy name for us to come up with because we'd been banding about this idea that there is no religious freedom without the freedom to dissent, and that is one of my mother's many mottos. In the United States, we always uh, hear praise for the concept of freedom of religion, but you rarely hear praise for the corollary, necessary concept of freedom from religion, and uh, particularly freedom from religion and government. And as you know, in many languages, of and from is the same word. And so we thought that would be a good concept to remind the country about, and we added the foundation just to be alliterative. And uh, we went before that city council, and it was all over the front pages, and people contacted us and wanted to join us, and, and the rest, they say, is, is history. And uh, I think, though, after last night's debate, maybe we have to change our name. Maybe uh, we're determined to be free from religion? I'm not sure. But anyway, after a year of cogitating about it um, and, and protesting it, our city council in Madison, Wisconsin, dropped prayer altogether. You know, we prevailed, reason prevailed. And, uh, but you may know from the headlines that this divisive issue of gov governmental prayer is a big deal in the United States. It's, it's been a big deal for us since we founded the group. It's one of the most common complaints that we get. And of course, there was a Supreme Court decision May 5th that I'll tell you a little bit about in a few minutes. Um, but when we started the Freedom from Religion Foundation, we never imagined that we'd still have it operating today. We thought it would just take a few years to remind the United States about our secular roots. And then things would go back, the pendulum would swing back, and Jerry Falwell, they would quit treating him like a media darling, and our country would go back to normal. And since most people here are Canadian, although I'm sure you probably know uh, more about the constitutionality of our country than most Americans, I will, or US citizens, I will just go through the basics. And of course, the United States was first among nations to adopt an entirely godless and secular Constitution, and that was done deliberately. The original uh, Articles of Confederation, that was the first failed document that, that uh, was around for about seven years, was full of religion. And they wanted a fresh start. They were aware of the warfare and bloodshed in Europe and in the individual colonies. And they held a constitutional convention that went on for four months. It was very heated. And guess what? It, they never prayed once. And Benjamin Franklin at one point suggested that they should pray, and people were embarrassed and adjourned for the day, and he recorded it in his own minutes. And the only references to religion in the U.S. Constitution are exclusionary, such as that there should be no religious test for public office. So um, we really did feel that it wouldn't take long to remind people about this. Um, but protesting prayer on government was really just uh, the tip of the iceberg in terms of the impetus that my mother and I had in founding FFRF, um, there's quite a backstory to our determination to keep religious dogma out of government. And I want another show of hands. I'm wondering, uh, I, I'm a second generation free thinker. I was very fortunate to grow up in a home that was free from religion. How many of you had that same fortune? 
So it's, this is a lot more than the show of hands I would get in the United States. So you're way ahead of us. But so those of you who grew up without religion, I think you know how fortunate you were. Um, my mother was a, a second generation free thinker. I'm a third generation free thinker. Dan's and our daughter Sabrina is a fourth generation free thinker, but it's very rare in the United States. And my parents uh, felt that it is unconscionable to inflict uh, dogma upon small children, uh, theological abstractions such as original sin and substitutionary atonement, for heaven's sakes, damnation and hellfire. And uh, they agreed. I was going to read some quotes, and I think it was kind of fun that Christopher had you guess, and Dan, you cannot participate. Why don't I read a couple of my favorite quotes, and I'll ask for you to tell us who, who wrote them. Um, any system of religion that has anything in it that shocks the mind of a child cannot be a true system. Does anybody? Very good. Thomas Paine. That's the age of reason. Uh, this one might be harder. If the concept of a father who plots to have his own son put to death is presented to children as beautiful and as worthy of society's admiration, what types of human behavior can be presented to them as reprehensible? Anybody recognize that? <laughs> Well, that, Ruth Hermance Green would have been very flattered. Uh, she wrote the Born Again Skeptic's Guide to the Bible. She was one of our founding members, um, died shortly after, and she wrote this book that is still our bestseller, uh, kind of a modern age of reason. Now, this one might be more recognizable. This is the last quote about children, not inflicting dogma on children. The memory of my own suffering has prevented me from ever shadowing one young soul with the superstitions of the Christian religion. Well, that's Elizabeth Cady Stanton, the woman's Bible. So if anything is sacred, besides sleeping in on Sundays, it's the young mind of a child and protecting it from neuroses inducing supernatural claims. So my parents, and of course I, have felt that children deserve to grow up free from religious indoctrination until they are mature enough to make up their own minds for themselves. And of course, we have the opposite point of view of the Jesuits. Give me your child until he or she is seven and he, and sh he or she is mine for life. Uh, religious indoctrination is really a form of an abuse of uh, adult power over children. So I was lucky. There were no God genes in my family tree. And I was kind of a secular Pippa. God wasn't in his heaven and all was right with my world. But unknown to me and unknown to my parents, even at the time, was that there were cracks going on in, in our secular paradise in the United States in the 1950s. And you are aware that of the Cold War. And that brought a whole series of very major symbolic violations that have really transformed the United States in a negative way, made our battle of church and state much harder. And uh, so about the time that I was born, and I am giving away my age, there were a series of revisionist laws passed by the US Congress undermining our secular constitution. In 1952, Congress passed the National Day of Prayer, and that was at the behest of Re Reverend Billy Graham, who said he, went to, he had a revival in Congress at the, on the steps of the Capitol, and he told everyone, I want to see uh, members of Congress on their knees to Jesus Christ. And he came up with the idea of a National Day of Prayer, and within three weeks, Congress passed it, uh, ordering the president to proclaim one day a year to be a national day of prayer. And there has been one ever since. It was rotating. And then the fundamentalists, in 1988, when Ronald Reagan was president, got, got them to fix it to the first Thursday of every May because they said it was too hard to organize politicians around their national day of prayer. And uh, 1954, our secular Pledge of Allegiance was tampered with. And you know, I don't really believe in these Pledges of Allegiance, but I, you may be familiar. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Well, in 1954, they decided, ironically, uh, to divide one nation indivisible by inserting the words, one nation under God indivisible. And in 1955, you saw that, that little uh, slide that Christopher had up. In God We Trust, it was ordained that In God We Trust had to appear on all of our currency. 
it had gradually gotten on the coins, but it hadn't been on the, on the currency. And in 1956, Congress adopted Ngabi Trust as the national motto. Actually, the second motto, joining the first, which had been chosen by a very distinguished committee of Franklin, John Adams, and Thomas Jefferson, the Latin, e pluribus unum, from many come one, uh, celebrating you know, that there are many states, but all united under a federal government. And these have been very, very difficult uh, symbolic violations to overcome. And there's a, another violation I'll talk about in a little bit. It's, it's a little uh, more difficult to explain, but in 1954, Congress um, decided that they wanted to reward ministers for fighting godlessness, that's in the congressional record, and they passed a housing allowance law giving preferential treatment to ministers so that they could be paid through a housing allowance by their churches and that portion of their salary that was a housing allowance is totally excluded from taxable income. So it's a huge benefit. They not only don't pay as many taxes, but tax-free dollars go further so it aids the churches. They don't have to pay as high salaries and can spend that money on proselytizing. So uh, I'll come back to that one. But so I recently realized, you know, for goodness sake, I spent most of my life fighting these Cold War violations of separation um, between church and state that were enacted in the decade that I was born. And uh, to balance the picture, there have been a series of very strong Supreme Court cases barring religious instruction, Bible reading, prayer, etc., in our public schools. But it does require constant vigilance by our staff attorneys and others to enforce these Supreme Court decisions. So it was in that kind of context that um, my mother um, and I decided to form FFRF. In the late 1960s, she became involved in uh, fighting for decriminalization of criminal abortion laws. And um, I, you had the sort of same issue here in Canada. You know, abortion was not legal. Um, there were so many deaths. It was a matter of life and death. Uh, and she was the first in Wisconsin to call for legal abortion, and she created the Wisconsin Committee to Legalize Abortion, and so she went around the state educating and lobbying for this very important reform, and I was trailing after her as a middle schooler and in, in high school, and everywhere we went, at radio, TV, uh, college, um, campus tours, that kind of thing, it became very obvious what the opposition to abortion was, it was all predicated on religion. We would go to our state capital, Madison is a capital city, and the capital would be full of nuns and priests and busting parochial school kids every time there was a law, a, a, a bill being considered to liberalize contraception or to consider liberalizing abortion rights. And so our eyes were opened at that time for this particular issue to the danger and harm to women and to civil liberties of ever having religious dogma enshrined and legislated through our civil laws. We saw who the enemy was, the, the organized opposition to uh, women's rights as well as uh, gay rights, uh, creationism, death with dignity, um, stem cell research. It's always been the organized uh, religious lobbies. An equal rights amendment in our country which was defeated by the kind of cabal of fundamentalist Mormon and Catholics. And so we were persuaded we had to do all in our power to keep religion out of our laws. And I did want to say something about Wanda's talk, which is so important, this death with dignity issue. And here again, it is the Roman Catholic Church in, in the United States also that is the most powerful opponent of that. So um, we had many early successes besides stopping city council prayer. For example, I was a student and I had been very offended at my high school graduation that there was a Protestant minister brought in to give the, uh, Bened the invocation and a Catholic to give the invocation at the end of that. And so I thought, I don't want to sit through another graduation and be prayed at. So as a sophomore, I decided to inquire what to do about that. And I went to the senior class officers and gave them my little homily about why it was inappropriate for a public university, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, which had many foreign students um, to have Christian prayers. And they agreed with me, and they took it to our chancellor, who turned out to be a closet agnostic, and he agreed with us. And in 1977, I stopped a more than 130-year violation very easily. 
in a matter of a month or so. One of the easiest uh, victories that I ever had. It gave us a false sense of how easy this battle was going to be. And uh, in 1978, my mother was asked to go national with the Freedom From Religion Foundation. And for many decades, we have had members, Canadian members from, from every province represented. And it's so nice to meet many of you here today. And uh, our two purposes are to work for uh, uh, the separation of church and state, to defend the Thomas Jefferson wall of separation between religion and government, and to educate the public about non-theism. So we serve as a, a national organization for atheists, agnostics, skeptics, rationalists. We like to joke, we don't care what you call yourself, but we all disbelieve in the same gods. And so we started with the two of us, and now we've gone to over 20,000. And um, uh, we're the largest uh, atheist agnostic organization in North America. And uh, when we were at lunch, um, Dan and I were sitting next to a couple, and they said, are we a couple? And I said, well, yeah. <laughs> uh, May 30th is our anniversary. And uh, in keeping with last night's theme, um, we've been married three to the third. Uh, that's 27 years. <laughs> but Dan was not a co-founder. He was a religionist. He was an evangelist back in 1976 and 78, weren't you, Dan? He he saw the light later. <laughs> and he'll tell you about that tomorrow. <laughs> it's an honorary co-founder. So we went from all volunteer for many years to today having more than 14 staff members and growing. And we're in the middle of a big building expansion in downtown Madison, Wisconsin. We're two blocks from the Capitol and very close to the University of Wisconsin-Madison where we really enjoy working with all the student interns and we have five staff attorneys and many legal interns, and our staff attorneys work to end many violations of religion and government without our having to go to court, we hope. But we also go to court. Um, we're very active in the courts. We've taken more than 60 lawsuits. Uh, one, about half of them, and about 12 of, uh, of those are ongoing. And um, in fact, we had a very significant victory two weeks ago it was a settlement about the time that the Supreme Court ruled, May 5th, that it's fine for a city government to allow sectarian prayer. Um, the Greece, New York case, how many of you got some of that news about that? Yeah, you all know about it. Well, there were two plaintiffs, and Linda Stevens um, is a lifetime member of FFRF, and she was the atheist plaintiff. And then Susan Galloway was the nominally Jewish plaintiff. And this case was not, not ours. It was taken by Americans United for Separation of Church and State. But they had complained for years. They had had reason to go before their city council about feeling excluded. And for 12 years, um, every other week, the town of Greece, New York, had invited clergy to come in and begin the meeting with Christian prayer. And it had been going on for 12 years. And only four instances had they ever had non-Christians. And that was after Linda and uh, Susan complained. But of course, they didn't want any prayer at all. And the Supreme Court, in a decision written by one of our Catholic justices, Kennedy, who voted with the other Catholic justices, five of them, said that was fine. Basically, uh, turning non-believers and non-Christians into uh, outsiders. Um, but at the same time that decision came down, we had a good victory on government prayer in Pismo Beach, California where we went to state court. We did not invoke the federal constitution. And they had a Pentecostal preacher. They appointed him town chaplain. They gave him an office. And he would preach long-winded theocratic sermons. Um, they were you know, five minutes or more, some of them, more like sermons than prayers. And we had complained, and local people had complained for about two years, and they wouldn't do anything. When we went to state court, they capitulated completely. They fired him as chaplain, and they said no more prayers ever again uh, before, during, or after city council meetings. And that will hold because it was in state court. So that was a good victory, but you know they're really hard to come by these days. And um, I'm going to tell you about a couple of the cases that we um, have going. Um, uh, the one that has us so unpopular with every church in the United States, I'll tell you about first. Uh, we are suing the Internal Revenue Service, the IRS, uh, for its um, 
law, in, uh, it's parish exemption law, the housing exclusion that I told you about, where members of the clergy, only members of the clergy, can be paid through a housing allowance which is excluded from their taxable income. And we started that lawsuit with taxpayers in California, uh, headed to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, the most liberal court of appeals in the United States, which is based in Seattle, which had indicated that it thought that the parish, the housing allowance exclusion is unconstitutional. Uh, because of another decision by the Supreme Court, we were gonna get thrown out. So we revamped the lawsuit and filed it in Madison, Wisconsin in federal court with Dan and myself as the main plaintiffs. You have to prove standing in order to stay in court and that is the biggest hurdle right now. They're slamming the courthouse doors shut. They don't want anyone to be able to take lawsuits and you have to prove your injury. So FFRF has been paying Dan and me a housing allowance. We can't claim it, showing our, creating our injury and our standing. And in November, well, first, the government tried to claim that we were like ministers. And even though Dan is a former minister, you don't gotta be a minister to work for FFRF. That was ridiculous. And we fought that. And then in November, the, uh, the federal court agreed with us that the housing allowance is unconstitutional, uh, very firm victory. And the Obama administration and the IRS are appealing it, even though it's not in their self-interest. It costs billions and billions of wasted tax dollars that they do not get because of this benefit. And so right now there are the briefing's going on and seven amicus briefs have been filed against us and they do represent virtually every denomination in the United States, including our friends, including uh, Un Unitarian Universalist Association and their various ministerial associations, including the American Baptists, who usually are with us on state church. You know, it's a matter of who wants to give up a tax benefit. And, um, and, and of course, the fundamentalists and the Catholic Conference of uh, Bishops, and you name it, and Muslims, and the Jewish groups are as up and up in arms as anybody. And there was a filing by the Orthodox Jews saying that they had to have a housing allowance because they have to live close to their synagogue because they cannot work on the Sabbath or high holy days. And what that means is you can't drive a car. <laughs> so that was what they filed before the court. Well, I thought it was ridiculous. <laughs> so anyway, that, uh, we're, being, we're briefing that um, by the end of the month. Hardly anybody is, is uh, submitting any friend of the court briefs on our behalf. And this is a, a, a case that will be going up to the Supreme Court. Um, we have an even hotter case against the IRS. I don't know if you've been following that many ministers, especially fundamentalist ministers, are openly violating the tax code, um, turning themselves into the IRS by endorsing, especially the presidential candidates from the pulpit, which is illegal because if you're a tax exempt organization, that's taxpayer subsidy. Um, and that would mean that political speech is being subsidized by taxpayers. So no 501c3 tax exempt organization, and this is probably true for the equivalent in Canada, can get involved in politics. So um, all of 1900 uh, pastors endorsed uh, Mitt Romney, I guess, in the last presidential election and turned themselves into the IRS, and the IRS won't do anything. It's not enforcing its tax code. So FFRF filed suit um, pointing out that as a 501c3 organization ourselves, we obey the law and that this is unfair. And that one is turning into a very significant fight um, because the churches are trying to say that they have a free speech right to endorse from the pulpit. And if they are allowed to retain their tax exemption and endorse from the pulpit, um, it will turn Citizens United into child's play. If you followed Citizens United, you know, no holds barred corporate funding in political campaigns, you know, churches would be turned into political wards and there would be no accountability for that money that would be poured into elections. And I think we would lose our secular republic. Um, so we are suing over that. And, um, uh, but to get back up, one more, one more thing I forgot to say about the Greece, New York case, and that is that um, 
uh, both Linda and Susan, who are the brave plaintiffs, and they got death threats, will be Freethinkers of the Year at FFRF's 37th Annual National Convention, which will be at the Los Angeles Biltmore Hotel, um, October 24th and 25th. So it's on the West Coast, and maybe some of you can come. And we have a really good lineup. Donald C. Johansson, for example, Discoverer of Lucy, will be there. And uh, we will also begin the convention with a secular invocation. After this Greece, New York ruling by the Supreme Court, we felt we really had to fight back. And so FFRF has launched the Nothing Fails Like Prayer Award. <laughs> and think of it, you know, the cemeteries are full of people who prayed to live, and the universe is full of unanswered prayer. And, um, you know, get off your knees and get to work, politicians. So that is, we are going to uh, have people submit um, evidence that they've been able to give an atheist homily or a free thought invocation before their city council because there was a little bit of wording in the Supreme Court decision to encourage that, and we will, uh, they will begin the convention. And um, so we have another saying at FFRF, and that is that freedom depends on free thinkers, and we very firmly believe this, that you know and can see that most social, moral, scientific progress has been made by free thinkers, um, so we here in this room and in this movement are really fighting not just to defend secularism, but the enlightenment. And to see the harm of dogma in government, you have only to read the daily newspaper, and it could be, I could give you one of many examples, but uh, two words, Boko Haram, you know, uh, Western education is sinful. We see these uh, fanatically religious men abducting uh, hundreds of young schoolgirls while uttering Allah Akbar uh, to stop their education and seize them as property and sex slaves that they can sell as booty. And boy, it's right out of the Old Testament, if you've read it, uh, which is shared in common by the three Abrahamic religions. And it's very painful to have to see women around the globe, especially in Islamic nations, having to reinvent the wheel that women free thinkers and feminists in the Western world have uh, already um, accomplished this, fighting these same battles for life and health and education and freedom because of religious sway over our laws. Religion puts dogma first, and free thinkers and humanists put people first. And uh, we put reason over holy books. So it's quite a battle. And for those of us in the United States, it's this Dickensian best of times and worst of times. And the worst of times, of course, I've mentioned, is the US Supreme Court. And this domination right now of five men voting in lockstep has had a very chilling effect on our law and our ability to fight that law in the United States. But it's the best of times in terms of the growing percentages of free thinkers in the United States. And I think you're aware, we haven't quite caught up to you in Canada, but we're getting close there. 20% uh, of people in the United States today identifying as non-religious. And is the statistic about 25% in Canada? Something like that. Oh, I'm hearing mutterings, what? 24.7. 24.7, there you go. <laughs> and um, <laughs> she wants a source. <laughs> Do we have a source? <laughs> but I think that that's pretty much what I saw too. I kind of Googled it. Um, but in the United States, uh, the sources are the American Religious Identification Survey, which actually was about 15% several years ago, and then Pew. And uh, Pew, which does a lot of um, studies, is very reputable, showing that it's about 20% of adult um, U.S. citizens identifies non-religious. They don't necessarily say atheist, but but that's what you know. They don't go to church. They don't pray. They don't believe in a god. So, um, and about 30 percent of young people in the United States identify as non-religious, and that is a huge huge sea change. And at FFRF, we have student activist awards, and we used to just have one, and last year we gave out seven, and we could be giving out more. Uh, there's so much activity on the college campuses, the secular 
student alliance, high school clubs, it's, it, free thought is in flower again. And, um, but there's uh, research, uh, the University of Minnesota did a big longitudinal study that they announced in 2006. And what they did is look at all the out groups and um, see how things had changed from the 1960s to the present. So they looked at African Americans, they looked at women, they looked at uh, gays, uh, Muslims, Arabs, and, and atheists. And everybody had made huge um, strides in social acceptance. Every single group except one just stayed right in place at the bottom of the totem pole. And I think you can guess what group that was. That's the atheists. And when I was interviewing Pe Penny Wedgell on Free Thought Radio with Dan, I said, well, uh, you know, when I read your research, the, there's these ridiculous stereotypes. People think that atheists are criminals and prostitutes. And I said, where did they come up with these ridiculous ideas? And she said to me, well, many U.S. citizens have never knowingly met an atheist. And so that's when we came up with our Out of the Closet campaign. And I'm going to now go, this is the portion that's show and tell. Let's see that. Do I have the right? Oh, sorry. Okay, so we came up with this out of the closet billboard campaign, and we've taken it to about eight states, or eight cities. And uh, just this last week, uh, a bunch, 11 billboards went up in uh, Cleveland area and Akron. And the idea behind these billboards is there are FFRF members, they're local atheists, agnostics, secular humanists, skeptics, and they come up with their own slogans. And uh, they, they need to be, up, be eight words or less because it's a billboard. And then we put their full name, usually, and their city, and identify what they do and, and what their atheist appellation is. And this is because when we started doing billboards in 2007, I was inundated with wonderful slogans from practically every member. Why didn't you put this on a billboard or that on the billboard? And I thought, well, why don't we let people speak for themselves? Because free thinkers are really our best advertisement. So that's a sample. Um, here's our chapter in um, Cleveland, um, having some fun. This was the secular ladies billboard. And look at the row of men, they're, they're the thinkers, <laughs> the free thinkers. Um, this is an octogenarian couple identifying as grandparents and atheists, and that's kind of myth dispelling in the United States, although free thinkers actually tend to be older rather than younger. And Roni Berenson is actually known nationally as a human justice uh, ab advocate and activist, and she came to the United States in 1941 escaping the Holocaust as a young girl. Um, here's another one, and this is kind of cute. <laughs> they went and got a group picture. Um, these are college students with the local Secular Student Alliance in Akron. And they're, they're on billboards in Akron. Um, this is the leader of our chapter and her husband. Um, these are more uh, pharmacists, aerospace engineers, and um, here's a caring mortal, not an immortal. And you can see he is caring. He's very popular with his friends. <laughs> so we've done this all over the country. The most impressive one was in December, where we actually put up 55 billboards in Sacramento. We put out the call thinking, oh, we'll put up about a dozen billboards. And everybody wanted to be on one. And it got a lot of attention. It was very, really fun. And then um, we also think it's important to start getting on TV. Uh, we're trying to reach the mass media. We have a newspaper, we have a radio show, we have billboards, but um, we need more TV presence. And so I have some exciting news, at least it's exciting to me because I've been working on it a long time. Uh, FFRF will be airing the first atheist commercial that's ever been on the John Stewart Daily Show and the Colbert Report. And that will be next Thursday, May 22nd. It's live. And, um, oh, this is where I need some help, right? Um, it's, it'll air live, and then it's on the repeats two hours later. And what we wanted to do is, it was really expensive, but we wanted everybody to be able to tune in and watch it at the same time. So... Unfortunately, not available in Canada. Oh. Are you kidding? Why not? We don't have Comedy Central. Oh. But you can go online and watch it. No? 
Oh, gee, well, then this isn't going to be very exciting for you guys. I'm sorry. Well, I have a sneak preview of it, so you can watch it first, okay? Oh, I forgot to show you this. These are cute. Little boys. A loving atheist family. So that's kind of revolutionary in our country, anyway. So there they are. But here's what he Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist, and I'm alarmed by the intrusions of religion into our secular government. That's why I'm asking you to support the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics, working to keep state and church separate, just like our founding fathers intended. Please support the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. I assume you know Ron Reagan is related to President Ronald Reagan. So for the most part, he's a household name in the United States. So um, I think it was very generous of him to participate in that. He's part of our honorary board in the United States, along with a lot of other very kind and distinguished people. And um, we'd like to do other commercials like this. And maybe we can put one on in Canada. <laughs> so thank you. you respond? Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. There we go. <laughs> uh, how would you respond to people sa that say that in a world where people are being executed for being gay, for leaving Islam in the name of religion, atheist activists should focus more on where the greatest harm is rather than prayer in school or having God on your money or issues like that? Like, How would you respond to somebody that have that objection? We are trying to keep our secular republic and not go the way of theocracies by fighting what are actually very dangerous symbolic violations. The idea that you have God on the money, uh, whole generations have grown up thinking we must have God in our government. So, I mean, that's, that's the Islamist approach. And, uh, of course, we, we're trying to be a beacon, which, you know, we're losing that um, uh, moral influence when our own country entangles religion and government. And we are part of a global uh, battle to keep religion out of government. It's not in any way, um, I mean, of course, that's the specter that we would raise. And uh, the idea that you, uh, the new rules in Saudi Arabia, for example, that you're a terrorist if you're an atheist. Well, that's what our crank mail says to us in the United States. I mean, it's all the same battle. It's all on the continuum. And uh, what else would you have us do there? Um, yeah, well, I mean, I would answer the same thing. It's about, I, I would say, any, any kind of activity is better than doing nothing. And it's, it's also about preventing going in the same direction rather than just waiting until it happens and then fixing it. That's and, how I would. and I would also say that, I mean, I didn't go into um, these Supreme Court cases against religious instruction in the public schools and prayer, but they all involved extreme persecution of very small children by the dominant religion in their community. Um, this violation, I mean, freedom of conscience should be inviolate. I mean, this, this is a human principle. So, and children were um, getting the brunt of it when we had prayer in school or when we see violations. I, I can't think of anything more important than protecting small children from that. Yeah, but what, like, sometimes atheists are, um, they, a lot of people say, like, oh, you have a cross where the 9-11 uh, monument is, like, why, well, why is that such an important, like, a lot of people say, why is that such an important issue? Let them have their uh, cross. Like, do you have a nativity scene in public? Who's that gonna harm? Um, why wouldn't you just let that happen? I mean, I'm not agreeing with it. I'm just saying, how would you respond to some people that are... That yeah, well, I, I don't know about that particular lawsuit, but there is no court decision that says you can have a permanent cross on government property in the United States. I can't knock on wood because I'm a woman without superstition, but, you know, we'll see what happens. But if you can have a cross or a nativity scene on government property, 
then you're saying we're a Christian nation, we're a Catholic nation. Um, there are insiders in the community. The majority are the insiders, and those of you who are non-Christian or non-believers are the outsiders. I mean, the first thing that Adolf Hitler did was bring back prayer in school and, and close the abortion clinics. I mean, you do look at the continuum of um, uh, church state and see you know, the danger of ever uh, bringing, bringing in laws that tell people how they have to think and who they have to worship and that their knee shall bow and that their government will force them to do that. That's how you get beheadings of atheists in the name of religion. Thank you. 4.7 is actually Stats Canada, but uh, <laughs> I just wanted to source it out before we go on. Um, my question is how wise is it with today's Supreme Court composition in the United States to take cases in front of them involving, you know, secular thoughts and ideals? Um, and what is your perspective uh, strategically as to when this composition would actually be slightly more reformed. Well, of course, we all thought that Obama was going to have a chance to um, replace at least one of these five justices who I'm are more voting afraid in of lockstep. Obama, of Obama actually doing something about it than not. Right well, now. his two appointments, Kagan and Sotomayor, have been good appointments. They voted right. They voted with us. Sotomayor. I mean, I was dismayed that we had a sixth Roman Catholic appointed to the court, but um, she puts, her, puts the Constitution above her religious allegiance, at least so far she has. She knows what it's like to be a minority as, as a uh, you know, family coming from Puerto Rico. Um, what's disappointing about Obama is that for a constitutional scholar in his first uh, term, he did so little to get those appointments. They're, all kinds of vacancies on our district courts and our appeals courts. And he um, kind of let it go, and now he's a lame duck and he can't get them on. So, uh, you know, I don't have a crystal ball for you. Thanks. Uh, in addition to the existing sort of loopholes in tax laws and, and uh, infractions that are specific to religious institutions that are being selectively not enforced for that reason, uh, there have been uh, at least a few relatively high profile cases recently, I think, of much more ordinary tax fraud occurring uh, in, in big uh, kind of family run megachurch uh, conglomerates uh, in addition to, you know, on, on top of the, uh, uh, the housing allowance and all of that. Uh, is, is any of that, uh, actionable or uh, is FFRF just uh, uh, only concerned with, with the, uh, the places where basically the infractions are on the books? Well, the IRS would have to go after, if we wouldn't have any standing to sue or something like that. But the housing allowance is written in such a way that if you're one of these huge mega, path, mega church pastors and, and you're living in this huge mansion, you can claim, you can take off your taxable income up to the fair market value of rental of that mansion. So it's a huge, you know, it's, a, it's like and, a huge tax break. And if you happen to own more than one huge mansion? I believe you're only allowed to take one, but that would depend on the enforce of how the IRS is enforcing it. Thanks, Annie Laurie.